Hello, I'm Max Truscott, and this is the YouTube version of my top-ranked Aviation News Talk podcast, a weekly show with news and tips for pilots and student pilots to keep you safe. I'm the author of several books and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. Somatographic illusion affects all pilots, and it continues to kill them in five specific situations. And it brought down an Atlas Air 767, which we talked about last week. So whether you're a student pilot or an airline pilot with thousands of hours, you need to understand the five situations where you're likely to encounter somatographic illusion. And you need to know what to do when you experience it. Now please hit subscribe down in the corner so you don't miss next week's show. And now here's our show. Now let's talk about an important type of spatial disorientation that continues to kill lots of pilots and that's somatographic illusion. And here's why you should care. It doesn't matter how good a pilot you are or how many thousands of hours of flight time you have. If you don't understand somatographic illusion, it can sneak up on you and kill you so quickly that you'll have no idea why you just died. It affects VFR private pilots, especially when flying at night. It can affect instrument pilots on takeoff and especially when going mist. And it can even affect glider pilots in day VMC conditions. And of course, somatographic illusion was a key factor in the crash of an Atlas Air Boeing 767, which we talked about in episode 156. Part of the reason that somatographic illusion is so successful in killing pilots is that it is rarely taught to pilots. So when it happens, they have no idea that they've already been suckered into its trap. And yet, avoiding somatographic illusion is very easy. Unfortunately, the circumstances under which it occurs are relatively few, and they're easy to identify ahead of time. So just as you would prepare for any emergency, you can prepare for dealing with somatographic illusion. That way, when it occurs, you are prepared and you won't fall into its sneaky and subtle traps. For somatographic illusion, the response you need to take is very simple. Trust your instruments and then manipulate the controls until the instruments show you're at the correct attitude, which might be straight and level, or maybe it could be a, a normal climb, depending upon what's needed for a particular phase of flight. It really helps to understand what causes somatographic illusion, because once you understand that, it's easy to understand why your body and your senses are lying to you in creating that powerful sensation that makes you feel as if the aircraft is in a pitch attitude that's very far off from the aircraft's actual pitch attitude. It's also helpful to know the most common circumstances in which you may encounter somatographic illusion so you can be prepared for its effects and force yourself to ignore the strong sensations your body gives you about the aircraft pitch that are totally wrong. The best way to understand how somatographic illusion works is to try to understand the sensor which is giving us false information when our body is accelerated. And that sensor is one of the otolith organs that we have in our inner ear that helps us detect the position of our head. When you're walking or running, it's really helpful for your body to know if your head is leaning to the side or if it's pitched up or down. And that's what the otolith organs tell us. Now we have two otoliths in each ear and they're positioned at right angles to each other. The one of interest to us today is the utricle, which gives us feedback on how much our head is tilted forward or backwards. Before describing the utricle in detail, let's first imagine a very simple version of it. Imagine that you take a small piece of wood, perhaps a piece of a two by four, or even a small piece of plywood. Then find a piece of wire that's stiff enough so that when you bend one end of it and then let go, it springs back to its original position. Then take perhaps about six inches of that wire and stick it into the wood so that the wire goes straight up. Next, take a golf ball, drill a small hole into it, and mount the golf ball on top of the wire. Since the wire is stiff and standing straight up, the golf ball is nicely centered on the top of the wire. What we've just constructed is a version of one of the many tiny hairs represented by the wire that sends motion in the otolith organs inside our ears. And those tiny hairs do have a mass on top of them, which I'll describe in a bit more detail later. But for now, just imagine that each of those hairs has a tiny golf ball on top of it and that we can sense whenever the hairs move and the direction they move. Now let's take one end of the board and lift it up so it's higher than the other end of the board. If you're watching the YouTube version of this podcast, you're seeing an animation I created of this. I'm sure you can imagine that when you lift one end of the board, the weight of the golf ball is going to tilt the wire back toward the low end of the board. 
And that's how the hairs in the utricle in your ear react when you tilt your head backwards. As those hairs bend backwards, we correctly perceive that our head is tilted up because gravity applied to that mass at the end of each hair is pulling the hair backwards. The same thing happens when we are in an airplane in a climb, but only after the climb is stabilized and we're climbing at a constant rate. Since the airplane is pitched up, the weights on the ends of the hair are bending the hairs backwards and we correctly perceive that our body is not straight and level, but is tilted backwards. For example, if we took our board and attached it to the floor of our airplane, we would see the same thing in a climb. The golf ball would be tilted toward the back of the airplane throughout our climb. Well, so far, so good. The utricle in our ear is working the way it's supposed to work. Now let's look at how the utricle gets confused in this modern era where we drive fast cars and fly airplanes. For our next animation, we'll take the device we constructed, the board, wire, and golf ball, and set it down on a large, smooth table. Then take your hand and rapidly slide the board from one end of the table to the other to accelerate the board. Notice when you do that, the golf ball moves backwards toward the end of the table from where you started. Also note that when you stop moving the board, the golf ball moves forward toward the end of the table where you stopped pushing the board. In both of these demonstrations, the first where we lifted one end of the board and the second where we slid the board across the table, the golf ball moved to the back side of the board. And if this device was one of the hairs in the utricle in our inner ear, we would have perceived that motion as our head tilting backwards. But notice in the second demonstration, the board was perfectly level as we accelerated across the table. It never pitched up. So what you can see from this demonstration is that if we could only use the utricles to tell us what's happening to our body, we would never be able to tell the difference between our head tilting backwards and our body being accelerated forward because the feeling we experience is identical. But we do have other sensations in our body, including vision. And so if we can look outside and we can see the horizon, we can use that additional information to confirm that the pitch up feeling we're getting from the utricle is real. Or if that same pitch up feeling we're getting from the utricle is caused by acceleration, we can see that the horizon hasn't moved and know that the feeling we're getting from our utricle, that feeling like a pitch up, is actually acceleration and not a real pitch up. And that's why for the vast majority of our lives, somatographic illusion is not a problem and we don't pay any attention to it. But if you take away that clear view of the horizon, you no longer have a way to distinguish between whether the pitch up sensation you're getting from the utricle is truly a pitch up climb or is linear acceleration with no climb. So let's talk about the situations where pilots are most likely to be confused by somatographic illusion and kill themselves. Nearly 20 years ago, I wrote an article for avweb.com about night flying safety. And one of the illusions I wrote about was somatographic illusion. It occurs when pilots take off at night over a poorly lit area. So this is most likely to occur at airports located next to water, which appears black at night. It also occurs at airports in rural areas where you might be immediately over farm fields with no lights after takeoff. And also in forested and mountainous areas where there won't be any lights below you immediately after takeoff. In all of those situations, somatographic illusion can be very strong. And most of these accidents occur within one mile of the airport. What happens in these situations is that as the aircraft accelerates during takeoff, somatographic illusion causes pilots to perceive their head as tilting backwards and pilots will perceive that they're in a climb. Since they will perceive that they are climbing, they won't pull back on the yoke enough to actually climb. Instead, they are often flying straight and level or may actually be pushing forward on the yoke to give them a small descent. Now, this is never a problem in the daytime, as even though pilots experience the same sensations, the view of houses and trees below them gives them a correct sense of how close they are to the ground, so they'll pull back on the yoke correctly. But at night, and when flying over a dark and poorly lit area, pilots won't get any visual feedback and won't be aware that they are flying level instead of climbing. The solution to this problem is very simple. When taking off at night, pilots must look at their instruments immediately after rotation and verify they're climbing at VY, the best rate of climb speed for their aircraft, and that the vertical speed indicator is showing a positive rate of climb. Pilots have to resist the temptation to push forward on the yoke when their senses, specifically one of the utricles, is telling them incorrectly that they're in a climb. 
The same exact problem can occur when doing an instrument takeoff if visibility is poor, and especially when taking off in zero zero weather. Instrument pilots, you probably know that part 135 charter aircraft and part 121 airliners are not permitted to take off in zero zero conditions because it is so dangerous. But GA pilots flying under part 91 are permitted to try these dangerous takeoffs. However, what many of these pilots don't know is that taking off in zero zero weather is especially dangerous because the effects of somatographic illusion are so strong in poor visibility in zero zero weather. I can tell you that I did take off one time in zero zero way before I became a CFI, and it was one of the scariest experiences I've had flying, and I will never do it again. Later, we had a takeoff accident involving somatographic illusion at my home airport that killed all four people on board a Cessna 310 that took off in 00. The weather was so bad that day that the tower was unable to clear them for takeoff because they could not see the runway. However, they did advise the aircraft that it, they were permitted to take off, but at their own risk. The aircraft made it about a mile before it crashed into a high-tension tower while flying straight and low in the clouds at about 50 feet above the ground. AOPA later hired me to give a presentation to people in the community who wanted to know more about this crash. So what you can see is that being in the clouds is similar to flying VFR at night over dark areas. In both cases, you can't see the ground, and so it's easy to be tricked by somatographic illusion into believing that you were climbing when you're actually flying straight and level. A third situation where somatographic illusion is very common is at the beginning of a missed approach after a pilot has flown an instrument approach procedure and decides to go around. I see this virtually every time I fly with an instrument pilot. At minimums, the pilot will push the go around button if they have one. In most aircraft, they'll disconnect the autopilot. Then they'll add full power, which causes acceleration, and then raise the flaps and landing gear. <laughs> but what almost all fail to do is to pull back and pitch the aircraft up for a climb. Why? because their utricles are incorrectly telling them that they are pitched up and climbing. I can't tell you how many times I've seen pilots accelerating in the clouds level at 200 feet above the ground and not climbing. <laughs> this is incredibly dangerous, but also easy to fix. Instrument pilots, when you're going missed, remember to pitch up, verify that you're climbing at VY, and that you have a positive rate of climb on the VSI. Otherwise, you too may become an NTSB statistic. A fourth situation where somatographic illusion can occur, though it's less likely, is when landing, especially in poor visibility. As the aircraft decelerates, either in the flare or after you're on the ground, deceleration will give a false sense that your nose is pitched down. Pilots who aren't looking at the horizon will then tend to pull back too much on the yoke to counter what really is a false sense that their nose is pointed down. A possible fifth situation where somatographic illusion can occur is in gliders. Now, this is not well documented, and you would think this shouldn't be an issue in gliders because all flying is done in VMC, and you should be able to see the horizon. Now, the following comes from a paper presented by UK pilot Derek Pigo, that's P-I-G-G-O-T, who noted a number of accidents caused by unexpected dives. He attributed this to a low-G sensitivity among inexperienced pilots. But... Frankly, it sounds exactly like somatographic illusion because even though these glider pilots could see outside, they still reacted in response to that false pitch sensation felt from somatographic illusion. Now, here's a portion of what he wrote. Over the past 20 years or so, there have been a surprising number of fatal accidents in which the glider has gone into an ever-steepening dive until it hits the ground. Unless the pilots survive, it is impossible to be sure of the cause of these accidents, and it is difficult to believe that any fully trained pilot would hold the stick hard forward when to pull back would save his life. The first such accident I know about occurred in 1952. When releasing the winch cable, the cadet MK2 went into a vertical dive, hitting the ground past the vertical. There's absolutely no sign of technical failure, and at the inquest, the medical authorities suggested either a panic state or first epileptic fit as possible causes. However, any form of fainting or loss of consciousness would apparently have resulted in a relaxation rather than a push forward on the stick, and the glider being stable would have started to recover. Another accident for which no definite cause could be found occurred to a two-seater making a normal approach in rather turbulent conditions. In this case, the glider was seen to dive suddenly into a railway embankment just short of the airfield. Probably a reduction in loading was caused by the nose being lowered quickly 
or by turbulence, and apparently the student pushed hard forward on the stick. In this case, the student was reported to be very sensitive to low G, and there was evidence that the instructor had shouted out just before the crash. A personal experience not long afterwards convinced me of the cause of this accident. I was fully aware that my student was very sensitive to low G and was working on the problem. About 50 feet on a normal approach, we had some rough air so that momentarily we almost left our seats. The student's immediate and instinctive reaction was to push forward on the stick. I was just quick enough to close the air brakes and pull hard, and we hit the ground hard but on an even keel. Had I been a second later, we would have crashed, probably been badly injured. In this case, the student had reacted to what he thought was a stall, which, by the way, is exactly what the Atlas Air 767 accident pilot thought was happening when he pitched forward. So from this paper, it seems that even glider pilots can be subject to somatographic illusion. Earlier I mentioned I'd explain more about what the hairs inside the otolith organs actually look like, as obviously they don't have golf balls on them. The following comes from a NASA document, and I'll include a link to it in the show notes. The underlying physiology and functioning of the otolith organs are remarkably similar to those of the semicircular canals. Both systems depend upon inertia and the mechanical deflection of hair cells to initiate nerve impulses that are sent to the brain and interpreted as body movement. The utricle contains a thickened patch of specialized cells called a macula that consists of sensory hair cells interspersed with supporting cells. The free hair-like tufts extending from the hair cells are embedded in a gelatinous otholithic membrane which supports small piles of calcium carbonate crystals on its surface. Collectively, those crystals are called otoliths. The otoliths increase the mass of the otolithic membrane and give it more inertia. Even a slight movement of the otolithic membrane is enough to bend these hair cells and send sensory information to the brain. So to wrap up here, please remember these five situations that are known to generate somatographic illusion, which gives you a false sense of pitching up when you're accelerating and a false sense of pitching down when you're decelerating. One, taking off at night over a dark area with few lights. Two, taking off in zero, zero or very low visibility conditions. Three, starting a missed approach. Four, when landing as the aircraft decelerates in the flare or on the ground. And five, possibly in gliders, especially following cable breaks on winch launches. I hope you found that useful. If you would, please go ahead and hit subscribe and the notification bell so you'll know when next week's video has been posted. Thanks for watching, and when you fly, please keep the blue side up.